You know, I make plans to put videos out on certain dates, and I do my darndest to get them out on those dates. But Rooster Teeth just has to keep messing it up, doesn't it? Hey everybody out there in YouTube land, Jake of the One Man Band is back again and welcome to another Ruby in-depth look, analysis, review, whatever you want to call it. And this time we're going to be taking a look at the Volume 4 intro. Now the intro was pretty much dropped on the same day the episode was made available for me because I'm a double gold first sponsor so i pretty much had to watch two things and then make a video i was originally going to put the intro video and the episode video into one but there was just way too much to talk about in both and i didn't really want to be editing together an hour-long video <laughs> in two days so you're gonna be getting two videos instead and this is the intro video all right, so first off, I just want to commend um, Casey Lee Williams and Jeff Williams for making, once again, a fantastic song to go with the intro. Its lyrics were just so great, so spot on. I'm going to talk about the lyrics and what they I think they mean near the end of the video, but right now we're just going to focus on the visuals. Now, at the beginning, we see this sphere, and this sphere is surrounded by, by grim hands. And you can see the sphere contains all of the colors of our Team Ruby. Red, white, black, and yellow. But when a grim comes up and eats it, it is then broken apart. So this is symbolizing, you know, back in Volume 3 when the grim attacked Beacon. And then, also in the intro, it shows beacon tower being blown apart you can actually see the dragon up there frozen and it looks like it's made of stone so i think it'd be really cool if we at least got a few visuals in the actual series where we get to see beacon see the dragon and see if it's actually like made of stone or if it's just frozen up there but it looks like it's frozen slash made of stone up there right now but anyway the orb breaks apart into four individual orbs, each one of them the um, colors of Team Ruby. And as it splits apart due to the, it being eaten by the Grim, it destroys Beacon Tower and they are then scattered across the map of Remnant. We see Yang's orb goes to Patch, Weiss's orb goes to Atlas, Blake's orb goes way south and way east, going toward Menagerie, where a lot of Faunus are living. And then, of course, Ruby's goes toward Mistral. After that, we are then shown, you know, Ruby is there with the remnants of Team Juniper to form Team Ranger, or Team Junior, whatever you want to call it. And when it shows a Team, uh, you know, the rest of Team Juniper, you can see that there is an open space where Pyrrha was supposed to be, or is supposed to be, to make Team Juniper. And, you know, that's just a little hit in the feels right there. You know, it just shows that we're still remembering Pyrrha and that we're still honoring her name. But... She's dead, she's gone, let's move on from it, shall we? But always remember her, remember. And then, as it pans out away from the team continuing on their journey, we see that Crow is watching over them. But not only is Crow watching over them, but we also see another dark-colored bird fly past him. So, the real question is, is this Raven? By the way he looks at the bird as it flies by it looks like he's a bit confused or questioning why it's flying past so the bird flying past crow is it raven or is it just a representation of crow or is it a small nevermore i guess we'll just have to find out but i think 
perhaps it's Raven, and Raven is maybe observing everything. Because, um, I've heard somewhere that the... That Raven and Crow are based off of Odin's ravens, who always observed things and then went back to tell Odin what was going on. So maybe they're just observing. But then, of course, you guys are thinking, why is it Raven over where Yang is? Why isn't she she watching over Yang? Because she doesn't, you know, because she doesn't need to look after Yang. Okay, she needs to do other stuff. So after it shows Crow, it then goes and it shows Weiss. Weiss says pretty much locked in her tower as we thought she would be. But we see that she's joined by a few new characters, primarily a character that looks like a butler. And from the first episode, we know his name is Klein. But we also see a character behind Klein and he has white hair and blue eyes. And who else have we seen that has white hair and blue eyes? Other Schneez. So is it possible that he is a brother? Maybe a cousin? I mean, I would think more along the line of brother, but once again, it, it makes you think, well, if Weiss has all these siblings, why was she so alone as a child? Me and my girlfriend discussed it, and we came to the conclusion maybe this brother of Weiss's was kind of taken to the side with Papa Schnee, and Papa Schnee is kind of molding and constructing him to be, you know, just like him, this businessman. So maybe he's just always been at the Schnee estate and has never really left. Winter joined the military and Weiss was able to get away for a while, but is now stuck at home again. So maybe instead of seeing more Winter, we're going to see this brother character instead. After it shows Klein and supposedly Weiss's brother, we see Papa Schnee and who, who looks like Ironwood. It almost looks like Ironwood. It may be Ironwood or it may be someone else entirely, but whoever they are, they're in military dress and it looks like they have five o'clock shadow on them. So if it's Ironwood and he has five o'clock shadow, that shows that he's, you know, stressed out. He hasn't been shaving every single day like an officer of the military would. Officers in the military are normally always clean shaven, but it looks like um, they were discussing something because we can see a chess game in progress on the coffee table that would have been in between them. And of course it would make sense for Papa Schnee and Ironwood to be talking because they've both worked together on military projects. After zooming in to Papa Schnee's eye, we see that Weiss is struggling with one of her glyphs behind her. So I believe this signifies that Weiss is not only going to be struggling with her semblance and her ability to summon creatures, but also having troubles with her family because that is the Schnee semblance, heretical semblance glyph behind her. So. She's gonna be struggling maybe on both sides with those things. We then transfer the Blake and we see that she's on a boat. And it's gonna be quite amazing for her to be on a boat because now we're gonna be able to see maybe some aquatic grim that everybody keeps talking about. And not long after it shows Blake, it shows that she is um, joined by Sun. So Sun is going to be joining Blake wherever she is, which I think, you know, is kind of low because like, unless Sun purposefully went out to track her down, that seems kind of low that Blake would go to all this trouble to leave everyone, leave her team, but then when Sun shows up, she's okay with it. But I guess we won't truly find out if she's okay with it until we actually get to her episode. But with Sun being there, it begs the question, does he bring his team with him? Is the rest of Team Sun there? Or is it just Sun? Or is it just Sun and Neptune? But either way, Neptune being on a boat, surrounded by water, doesn't just sit well with me. Because 
it, sure, it's going to probably make for like, ah, he surrounded by water. He's always going to be scared, funnies. But it's like, why? Why would Neptune do this? Why would he do? Why would he do this thing where he's going to be surrounded by the thing that he's afraid of? <sighs> I'm just going to go into a rage if I think about it for too much. But anyway, we know that Sun is going to be with Blake. And then we see Blake is joined by a rather large man who is her father. This is definitely Blake's father. You know, he's this big, burly guy. He almost looks kind of like a pirate, but he may be a pirate. He may not be a pirate. If he's a pirate, it'd be cool. But I think it just is cool that we're going to be able to see Blake's family. Because as far as we know, we didn't know she had a family. We thought that she grew up on the streets alone. You know, pretty much from the beginning, she was a member of the White Fang. So was her father, was her family a member of the White Fang too? Is he still a member of the White Fang? Did he leave? Is he the leader of the White Fang? So many questions! But we also see another character join this grouping once Blake's father pushes son away from his daughter and another character comes out from around Blake's father. Now, there was some thoughts about who this character was. When he, this character was first teased at New York Comic Con, people thought, oh, uh, it's a brother. You know, it looks like Blake's brother. But if you really look at it, it's like, well, you know, it kind of has the female figure, you know, but then again, maybe it's a trap character. But if you pause at that moment and zoom into the character, they have age lines under their eyes. So the conclusion that me, my girlfriend, some other people that I was talking with this about came to, this is Blake's mother. She has a mother and a father still alive there for her now. Which of course begs the question, why would she go why would she go run off with the White Fang? Why would she go and run off with Adam? Why would she abandon her family to go do all these things? If she has a functional family. Why, Blake? Explain! Explain! So we know that Blake is going to have like family woes during this time, as well as having son there. You know, the whole bringing the boyfriend home, it's probably gonna be funny. But as Blake looks away, it transitions to Yang. So Blake is still thinking about Yang and how she she probably doesn't feel all too good about abandoning her team, especially Yang, since she pretty much caused all of Yang's pain. When we see Yang, we see that she's sparring with Tai Yang, you know, probably trying to get her back into the game, man. But as she's sparring, we see that she seems to be having trouble. She can't get in the zone. And then Tai Yang transitions to a Yang doppelganger who has both arms. And I think this symbolizes that Yang is going to be arguing a lot with herself. She's going to be thinking, the past me was so great when I had both arms, when I was still strong. Now I'm not. I can't do this thing anymore. There's going to be a lot of emotional just roller coastering with Yang, especially with the last bit of her <clears throat> part of the intro where she seems to be falling and in the background there's fire and you can see Adam's, you know, portrait and his mask in the background. So she's haunted by the memory of Adam. She is still frightened of Adam. And <clears throat> this is going to affect her during this volume. And then randomly, these two Faunus Yahoos appear up in front of her. They look like Faunus assassins from Assassin's Creed. Now, maybe these two are going to be like Faunus oppressors that come to patch in the name of the White Fang, and maybe Yang eventually has to fight them, or maybe they're going to be assassins that are actually sent by Adam to finish Yang off. You know that whole, I will destroy everything you love speech. Next, we see our group of baddies at the Grimscape. And as we see them, we see... Hazel, we see Cinder, we then see Tyrion, we see Dr. Watson, then we see Salem. And if you want more information about these characters, I would suggest go watch my episode one breakdown because 
pretty much what can be shown in the intro is that that wasn't shown pretty much in the episode was that it seems that um, Hazel is a strict melee brawler fighter because, you know, as it shows him, he's like doing the whole like, I'm ready to punch something. So besides that, there's really not much shown in this part that isn't explained in the first episode. After that, the intro's wrapping up and it's just showing a few key of frames, a, a few key flashes, if you will. The first one shows Ruby battling Tyrion, and we know from the first episode that Damien is going to be sent after Ruby to find and capture her. And we see that Tyrion has some form of arm blade weapons, as well as being very acrobatic, flexible, and even blocking one of Crescent Rose's attacks with his foot. So he's a very accomplished fighter and may be too much for Ruby to handle. Next, we see that Adam goes after Blake, much to Blake's surprise and frightenment. She's scared once again. You know, Adam, this, this once again kind of goes back to the whole, whole is uh, Blake's father the big member of the uh, leader of the White Fang? He's supposed to set up a meeting between the leader of the White Fang and Hazel, but he's still going after Blake in some way. We see him coming after her with his sword, killing one of her her uh, clones, and, you know, she's just, like, totally frightened, totally scared. And then we also see Weiss practicing her glyphs. I think a very big glyph at that, so I think she's going to be trying to keep up with her studies and trying to perfect her summoning. But, and we know that she's going to be working hard at it because she was focused during this um, flash, you know, she was focused and trying to get it done. And pretty much then the intro wraps up showing, you know, Team uh, Juniper kicking some butt, you know, killing some Grim. And then it shows Team Ranger set up, and we see once again the Blackbird flying to view. Is it Crow? Is it Raven? Is it both? Probably. On all of those. Maybe! And then we just have the title card and the intro ends. So, above all, this intro displays a lot of new characters. When I first saw it, I was just like, how are they going to keep up with anything when they need to bring in all these new characters, introduce them, give them actual character, and, you know, spend enough time with them? It's just going to be very, very big volume. And, um, it's, it's a good intro. I like it. But the, the one thing that I have to say about it is that just the whole bombardment with new characters may be just too much for old fans or even new fans to take because then it's like, well, well, who are all these people? Why weren't they introduced? And then this new guy, who are these bad guys? You know, where's Mercury and Emerald? You know, they weren't shown in the intro. So until they're fully introduced in later episodes, I think that the, the intro itself is good, but it was a bombardment of information, which I guess is what it's supposed to be because it's an intro. It's supposed to get you ready for the actual episode and the actual series. So, I guess it achieves what it's supposed to do? Alrighty, now let's talk about the music and the lyrics for a bit. Now, I'm not going to break down every single lyric, every single line. I'm pretty much just going to take the, the broadness of what the song is trying to say and trying to sum it up to you guys. Once the full you know, song actually comes out, maybe I'll do a breakdown of the full song, but that's later. So at the beginning, it seems to be talking about like, yeah, life, you know, was so good. It was so amazing. All this stuff was going on. It was like a fairy tale. Everything was going good. But, you know, that kind of describes the first few volumes, how it was. It's like everything was kind of going good. Good guys win, bad guys lose. Everything's going great. But then, you know, life turns out to be not a fairy tale. It's not a bedtime story. You know, things progressively get worse. Bad guys make, um, you know, make great strides. Characters die. Be beacon falls. All this bad stuff happens. But there's one line in there that says, a tragedy and a big reveal of a hero's glory. That's pretty much what it is. That's pretty much describing what happened at the very end of Volume 3 with 
Pira being killed, that's the tragedy. The big reveal of, um, you know, Ruby being a silver-eyed warrior and then the hero's glory is, of course, her being able to now knows about this power and will eventually be able to use it. Now, obviously, this the song is kind of describing how even though Team Ruby tried their best to do things that they weren't ready for, they truly weren't ready for this unfair game that was brought upon them by the by the baddies. So what happens when everything happens and there's just sorrow in life? Do you just give up? Do you just go home? When all hope is gone, what are you supposed to do? And I think the, the song really sums it up. You just live. You just keep going. Take your life one day at a time and just keep going. That whole, once again, motive of keep moving forward. You just gotta keep going. You can't let sorrow and depression get you down. And that's why I think this song is so rockin' because not only is it describing the show, but it's describing life. So, you know, you're just supposed to keep going, you know, have your head held high. It talks about how you shouldn't be conquered by sorrow. Don't let it conquer you. Don't let the past hold you down. And in the show, that's very much like, you know, don't let Pira's death hold you down. Don't let Penny's death hold you down. Don't let the fall of Beacon hold you down because tomorrow is a new day and tomorrow needs you to be at your very best because you don't know what's going to happen. But if you don't let it get you down, if you don't let, of course we should remember the past. We should remember Pira, we should remember Penny, but we shouldn't be just, you know, just held down by their, by their loss, by their sacrifice. We need to take that and own it. We need to keep going. It talks about how time mends all wounds and that's very much correct. Time does mend all wounds and above all, you should just live. Now, that that's of course t talking about how you should you know, live your life to the fullest, keep moving forward, all of that, but also, in war and in this game that's being played, you know, with the bad guys and the good guys, living is the ultimate revenge. If you live and the bad guys die, or if the bad guys know that you're alive, they still know that you're gonna be out there to stop them. So above all, just keep going, live your life, keep moving forward, all that good stuff. It's great. So with the visuals of the intro and the music of the intro, it's just one great huge ride. When it came out on the, when it was shown on the Ruby Facebook page, I just kept rewatching it over and over and over because I was so excited and so happy that it was out. And above all, I liked it. I'm excited for volume four and I can't wait to enjoy it with you guys. So. That's going to end this video. Be sure to like and favor if you've enjoyed. Subscribe, of course, if you feel inclined to. Be sure to check out my Volume 4 Episode 1, um, you know, review and some other re reviews that I've done, other Ruby videos that I've done. Um, and also check out Team Theory Facebook page. Remember to read the rules and to abide by them. My Twitter account. And if you want, check out my Patreon page. Big thanks to all my Patreon sponsors. You guys help me out a lot. Love you guys. And until next time, I need you guys to be a good person. Tip your waitresses. Keep moving forward. And I'll see you guys next time. I'll see you then. Yeah, yo! <laughs>